Hello everyone and welcome. I'm Dr. Diana Castro. I'm a pediatric neuromuscular doctor at the University of Texas Southwestern in Dallas. And I'm pleased to be here with you for this discussion. I will provide an in-depth look at Ibristi, a new medication approved for infants two months and older, children and adults with spinal muscular atrophy. This is a very exciting time for patients with spinal muscular atrophy. First, we have to go through some disclosures. This program is intended to provide general information about ABRISD and non-medical advice for any particular patient. Talk with your doctor to discuss what treatment regimen is appropriate for you. Individual results may vary in taking ABRISD and ABRISD may not be appropriate for everyone. This program is presented on behalf of Genentech and the information presented is consistent with FDA guidelines. This program may be monitored by Genentech for adherence to program requirements. Any adverse events, including in this presentation today, have already been reported to Genentech Drug Safety, and no action is required by any member of the audience. I have been compensated by Genentech to serve as a speaker for this program. All materials are the property of Genentech and may not be recorded, photographed, copied, or reproduced. Taking photographs, video recordings for this program is prohibited. These are some of the topics we will be discussing today. We'll talk about SMA, ABRISD, some of the results of the clinical trials in infants, children, and adults, safety information, and at the end, I will have the pleasure to invite two members of the community who will talk to us about the, uh, what is living with spinal muscular atrophy. So let's start taking a closer look at SMA. Spinal muscular atrophy is a genetic disease that causes degeneration of motor neurons. Motor neurons are important for the development of the nerves and the muscles. If they are not there, the muscle will develop weakness and atrophy. In the spinal muscular atrophy, there is lack of a protein called survival motor neuron. This protein is mainly produced by a gene called SMN1. Humans, we have two genes that can produce the SMN protein, SMN1 and SMN2. SMN1 is the main gene, SMN2 is just a backup. Unfortunately, patients with spinal muscular atrophy do not have SMN1. They only have the backup copy. Depending on how many SMN2 copies, that will determine the severity of the condition. And for that, there is a classification. There are different types with the most common wing type 1, followed by type 2 and type 3. Now, let's look at a breast steam. Ebristi is a medication that was approved, like I said, for infants older than two months of age children, and adults. This is not approved for kids under two months of age because there is not enough information yet. Before we talk about the mechanism of action and the trials, I want to talk about some safety information. Before taking a BRISD, tell your healthcare provider about all of your medical conditions, including if you have liver problems, are pregnant or plan to become pregnant. If you're pregnant, or are planning to become pregnant, ask your healthcare provider for advice before taking this medicine. Ebristi may harm your unborn baby. If you're a woman who can become pregnant, before you start treatment with Ebristi, your healthcare provider may test you for pregnancy. Because Ebristi may harm your unborn baby, your healthcare provider will decide if taking Ebristi is right for you during this time. Talk to your healthcare provider about birth control methods that may be right for you. Use birth control while on treatment and for at least one month after stopping a breasting. If you're an adult male planning to have children, a breasting may affect a man's ability to have children. Fertility. If this is a concern of you, make sure you ask a healthcare provider for advice. If you're breastfeeding or plan to breastfeed, it is not known if a breasting passes into breast milk and may harm your baby. If you plan to breastfeed, discuss with your healthcare provider about the best way to feed your baby while on treatment with a breastfeed. Tell your healthcare provider about all the medicines you take, including prescription and over-the-counter medicine, vitamins and herbal supplements. Keep a list of them to show your healthcare provider and pharmacist when you get a new medicine. You should receive a breastfeed from the pharmacy as a liquid that can be given by mouth or through a feeding tube. The liquid solution is prepared by your pharmacist. If the medicine in the bottle is a powder, do not use it. Contact your pharmacist for a replacement. 
avoid getting a bristi on your skin or in your eyes. If a bristi gets on your skin, wash the area with soap and water. If a bristi gets in your eyes, rinse your eyes with water. So now let's talk about a bristi. A bristi is designed to work by helping to make and maintain SMN protein. Within four weeks of a bristi, median SMN protein levels more than double and were maintained through 12 months of studies across all SMA types. Now we will discuss about the studies. There are different studies, but today we'll focus on firefish and sunfish. Firefish is a study for patients with SMA type 1 between 2 to 7 months of age. Sunfish is a study for patients between 2 years to 25 years of age with type 2 or 3. And there is also a third study that is more a supportive study for patients between 1 to 60 years of age with any type of SMA, 1, 2, or 3, who were previously treated with other medications for SMA. Let's start with firefish. Like I say, the study included infants with type 1 SMA between 2 to 7 months of age. It was an open-label study, meaning all patients were treated, and it had two different parts. Part 1 included 21 infants and part 2, 41 infants. Today, we'll focus on part 1 findings at 12 months. Part 1 explored the recommended dose, safety, and efficacy. The main measures were the ability to seed without support for at least 5 seconds and survival without permanent breathing support. Let's start talking about motor function. A scale called Bailey 3 was used to evaluate this area. There is an item in the scale that talks about the ability to seed for more than 5 seconds without support. As we see, 41% of these infants that got treatment were able to see without support. Why is this important? Because patients with a spinal muscular atrophy type 1 will never achieve this ability to see. They will never be able to see or to stand up or to walk. So it's very important that they were able to see unsupported. The second measurement they look was the ability of surviving without permanent breathing support. When we talk about permanent breathing support, we talk about a patient that requires a tracheostomy or requires more than 21 consecutive days of ventilation being invasive with a tube, what we call intubation, or non-invasive with BiPAPs for more than 16 hours a day. What we see here is that 90% of the patients at the 12 months mark were alive and could breathe without permanent support. And at 23 months, 81% of them were alive and were able to breathe without support. Additional exploratory observations, including the ability to eat and to swallow, we see that 88% of them were able to eat by mouth and also 88% of them were able to swallow. Now let's talk about the results in children and adults in the trial called Sunfish. A total of 231 children and adults with type 2 or 3 SMA between 2 to 25 years of age were included. The study was randomized, meaning some patients received the medication and some patients received placebo. It had two parts as well. Part 1 explored the recommended dose and safety, and part 2 mainly looked at efficacy by motor function. Out of the 231 participants, only 7 out of the 51 in part 1 were able to walk. The rest of the patients were not able to walk. And in part 2, out of the 180 participants, 120 had scoliosis, what we call scoliosis is the curvature of the spine, and of those, 57 had severe scoliosis. Our discussion today will focus on results from the first 12 months of part 2. Motor function was measured by the MFM32, or Motor Function Measure 32. This is a scale that evaluates 32 elements to assess head, trunk, and limb motor function. It relates to the ability of activities of daily living, things that we need every day, like transferings and so on. These elements can be grouped in three different categories. The first one, standing or transfer movements. The second one, upper and lower extremity movements. And the third one, hand and foot movements. Here we will see the results of this scale. What we see here is that after taking a BRISTI, the motor function improved in these children and adults. 
if you see the blue line is the line of the patients that were treated with the medication because remember there was a randomized study so these patients were getting the medication and you see that they had an increase on the scale of 1.36 points and these will relate in terms of the functional activities of these patients during the day the second group the group that was not getting the medication as you see had a decrease of 0 0.19 through the study even though patients with type 2 and type 3 lose function very slowly they will continue losing function the second scale that was used was a scale called RULM. This scale will help us evaluate the strength in the upper extremities, not only strength, but also function. So it looks at very common activities that we perform during the day. For example, picking up tokens or placing a coin into a small um, a cup or raising a cup to be able to drink. So things that we were using our hands every single day for. And here we see the results. After taking a breeze, the upper limb function improved in children and adults. The patients that were receiving the medication during the trial had a 1.61 point increase versus the patients that were not receiving the medication who only had a 0.02 point increase in this scale. Now we will talk about the additional safety information. Safety is studied in infants, children, and adults. Ebristi is being studying people from two months to 60 years old with type 1, 2, or 3 SMA. The most common side effects of Ebristi include for infants with type 1 SMA or infantile onset SMA, fever, diarrhea, rash, runny nose, sneezing, sore throat, and cough, or upper respiratory infection, lung infection, constipation, and vomiting. For children and adults type 2 or 3 SMA or later onset SMA, fever, diarrhea, and rash. These are not all the possible side effects of Ebristi. For more information on the risk and benefit profile of Ebristi, ask your healthcare provider or pharmacist. No one stopped taking Ebristi because of side effects in the main clinical studies after 12 months of taking Ebristi. The safety of Ebristi in people previously treated with other SMA medication is currently being studied. You may report side effects to the FDA at 1-800-FDA-1088 or www.fda.gov medwatch. So now let's talk about taking a Bristi. A Bristi is a liquid treatment that is taken by mouth or by feeding tube, meaning the gastric tube or G tube. The medication will be delivered to your house and you should be stored in the refrigerator. As I said, it comes in a liquid. If you receive it in a powder, please return it to the pharmacy. You will be provided with a syringe to measure the dose. The dose will be determined by your healthcare provider according to the age and the weight. It should be taken once a day, again by mouth or through the G-tube, and it should be around the same time every day, preferable after meals. Your treatment will include one month supply of the Bristi. Genentech has different support resources for you and your family. There is something called My SMA Support, this is a service provided by Genentech and it can help you navigate the whole process. From the time the medication is prescribed, you will have somebody, it's called a PAL, P-A-L, is a person that you can communicate to have updates about how the process is going with the insurance to get some product education, to have coordination for the delivery of your medication and so on. Today we have talked about Ebristi, the mechanism of action, route of administration, safety information, and different clinical trials. This slide is just to give a summary. We know that Ebristi improved motor function in two clinical trials in infants, children, and adults with spinal muscle atrophy. In the infants, it shows that 41% of kids that were treated were able to seed without support for at least five seconds. 90% of infants at 12 months and 81% of infants at 23 months were alive without breathing support. Motor function also improved in children and adults. This was measured by the scale called MFM32, where it shows an improvement of at least 136 points in these patients, the ones that were receiving the medication versus the ones that were on the placebo arm. A breeze increases the SMN protein level and it maintains this level in blood. Currently, there are safety studies that are ongoing 
in patients between two months to 60 years of age. It is important to remember that Brist is the first oral medication that can be delivered to your house. There are some safety information that it's important to remember. If you have any other medical condition like liver problems, please let your medical provider know. If you're pregnant or are planning to become pregnant, if you're breastfeeding or planning to breastfeed, or if you're a man who wants to have children, please let your provider know. Also, if you're taking any medication, not only prescribe medications, but medications over the counter, vitamins or herbal supplements, have a list of these medications for your provider. I'm really excited that our program includes hearing directly from members of the SMA community about their experiences living with SMA and taking a BRISD. Now, I am excited to introduce our three guests. Please remember the experience shared today are unique to them. Everyone responds differently to treatments, including a BRISD, and results may vary. Everyone should talk to their doctor about the right treatment option for them. And with that, I would like to welcome Adam from LA. Welcome, Adam. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm Adam, I'm uh, here in Los Angeles where I work as a CPA. Uh, I'm happily married and I have type three SMA. Um, looking forward to, to talking. Thank you so much and, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, we'll speak more about your experiences and as an adult living with SMA in a minute, but first we'll jump over the, um, our guest on the other coast and meet Erin and Kevin in New York. Their son Bear has type two SMA Erin and Kevin, can you tell us a little bit about yourselves and your family? Sure. Hi. Um, we both grew up on Long Island, and that's always been our home. We met in high school. We've been married since 2013. I work as a freelance photographer, and Kevin works for the local government as director of communications. Um, yeah, and Bear is five years old. He's very smart, very aware. Um, he's always been very advanced, you know, communication-wise. He asks lots of questions. You know, he's caring, he's sensitive, but, you know, he's also very silly, loves to play, loves his iPad. Great. And I, I want to take you a little bit back in time. Can you walk us through how did you find Bert had SMA? How was that process when everything started? Yeah, uh, we actually found out before he was born. During my pregnancy, we both did genetic screening and it came up that we were SMA carriers. So we decided to go ahead with an amniocentesis so that we could be prepared. Um, at the time I was pregnant with twins, which was already a big surprise. Um, right before I got the amnio, we were told that there was only one heartbeat. So we went ahead with the test for our remaining baby and it did come back positive. Uh, for SMA, and that was about six months into the pregnancy. Gosh, too many, too many news at once, and I can imagine how hard all of that was. Uh, can you tell us a bit, a bit more about what it was like getting him or getting the diagnosis? Yeah, initially we were just scared. Uh, the doctor's assistant at my gynecologist's office told us not to Google it, but of course I did. Um, and I didn't know what to expect. I don't think anyone really did at that time. Um, we were talking to pediatricians and gynecologists and they didn't know anything about SMA. Uh, we were told that Bear probably wouldn't be able to move at all and that he wouldn't live very long. So it really just felt like a death sentence. Um, but there was so much going on at that time, having just lost a twin and then finding this out that I think we just put all of that to the back of our mind and we focused on having this baby and then taking it from there. Great. And after he was born, how do you guys move forward with his care? Um, yeah, well, after we found out, you know, we talked to other families that had newly diagnosed kids. Um, we came to a big realization um, that really nobody's in charge of an SMA child's care. You know, if, if you have cancer, you have an oncologist, but that doesn't really exist for SMA. You know, initially we were under the impression that the pediatrician was that person, but really the parent is that person. Um, so we were also told that until Bear starts symptoms, um, there was nothing we could do. Um, everything seemed typical for the first few months. Um, so then when Bear was six months old, we had our first appointment at an SMA center and met with a neurologist to kind of talk about the next steps forward. Thanks so much for sharing. I'm sure that was a lot. And, and you know, it's very hard, especially at the beginning when I give like the first time we meet with a family to give them the diagnosis. If I have a suspicion, I try to get the diagnosis really fast and and these days, thank God, it's easier than it was before because it used to take a month now. We have it, the results earlier and I meet with them as soon as I can. Um, 
what I try to do with the families is first try to go through the condition. What is it? What is that it causing the condition? Because you have a beautiful baby that is looking everywhere, completely active, gorgeous, that you don't think anything is wrong or anything can be wrong with them. So trying to show them where the problem is, how the things uh, happen, and what are the things that we are gonna expect are, is very important from the beginning. I do talk about the genetics because obviously we have to give them support uh, testing the parents and trying to understand if they are carriers or not and what's the risk for next pregnancies. Um, and also, I introduce them to, to the rest of the team and I always let them know, it's not me, I mean, I'm only one small piece of the whole puzzle, but, but most importantly, we have our physical therapies, occupational therapies, we have uh, the pulmonologies and so on that help us, um, you know, with the patients as a whole. And, and the family obviously is, is very important. And I think the other piece that is important to me is trying to get them close to foundations and the groups of families, because I think community helps a lot. And that feeling of understanding of other families, knowing what they are going through, I think is very, very helpful. And now that we talk a little bit about the experiences of parents dealing with the diagnosis, I want to welcome Welcome back, uh, Adam, to tell us more about uh, himself and his experience and doll living with SMA. Sure. So I was diagnosed at three years old, and at the time, there were really no options in terms of uh, treatments, information about um, therapies and research was very limited, uh, especially for adults. There was there was almost no uh, adult-specific information out there. So, you know, we um, we we kind of did the best we could, but we were not we didn't quite have the information about adults that we wanted at that time. Um, and I'm happy to be here to share a little bit of that now. Great. And you know, it's very exciting because now we have, you know, we have options and, and, but I want to know a little bit about your journey. You know, you were diagnosed with SMA at a young age, but as you got older, how did things change for you? Well, I grew up in the uh, kind of outside of Baltimore in the, the Maryland area. And when I was growing up, I was uh, pretty ambulatory. I walked around school still. Um, when I left and came out to Los Angeles for college, um, at that point, I kind of switched and started using the, the power chair pretty full time. Um, the, the scale of the campus was just too big anymore. I, I couldn't walk around much. Um, you know, I could still walk around a dorm room, but not the entire campus anymore. Um, when I started using the power chair, that makes it a little bit tricky to get around the city in other ways. Um, I didn't have a car right away and you know getting a, a chair into a, a friend's car is tricky so you know we we do the best we can we try to figure out you know what ways metro is accessible what ways it isn't you know who has a car as a friend who doesn't um eventually i did get a car my uh junior year of college and it was a minivan that had uh modified steering and hand controls that allowed me to to get around the city and that was great um it really kind of improved my independence from that point forward, I kind of offered to be the driver anytime me or any friends wanted to go anywhere because then I knew I could get myself uh, there and back and not have to worry about the transportation quite as much. A lot of independence, yeah. And what happened after you graduate? What did you pursue career-wise? I graduated and got a job in public accounting. Uh, it's, a, it's a great place to start a career. I was um, traveling a little bit and working longer hours. Um, but it's, you know, it's a, a good career. I learned a lot. Um, I was open with the people I worked with about the types of combinations I needed, and I found them to be, you know, helpful and understanding. Um, but you, you do have to be forward and, and bring that to people's attention. Other people aren't always going to know what you need unless you tell them. Um, so I, I worked in public accounting for several years, and then I've uh, continued with my, my CPA career elsewhere. Great. And who have you turned to for support during each of these moments? My biggest supporter is definitely my wife. She, um, you know, she, it, there, there's some funny stuff that happens where um, you know, for actual like physical support, if I have to, you know, get a, a hand lifting um, myself up, she's about five foot one and I'm about five foot nine. So it's a, a funny angle when she's trying to like lift my, my whole body up and move it over, but we, we get that done. Um, for the most part, I, I operate you know as independently as I can day to day um, you know there are some household tasks that um, I like to do like cooking but I can't lift a heavy pot of water so I need help with 
with just that one aspect of cooking. Um, but with, with little adaptations here and there, I stay as independent as I can. And um, what's your wife's name? Her name is Carolina. Carolina. So tell us a little bit about uh, your family life. What do you do with Carolina? What do you guys like to do for fun? Sure. Uh, as I mentioned, we, we do some cooking and baking together. We're both kind of foodies. Uh, we live here in Los Angeles and we love going to uh, rock concerts specifically. It's a great area for that. Um, the last few years, we've even done a little bit of travel to go see, you know, uh, concerts and festivals in other cities. We have visited Denver and Chicago for events in the last couple of years. And that's been fun and exciting to, to kind of add that to our, our list of uh, activities. We have been hoping to do some more travel going forward. We even had planned a European vacation earlier this year. Uh, obviously that didn't happen with the, the current outbreak, but um, we, we have those plans in place still. And we're hoping that when everything settles, we can get back to them. Uh, travel with SMA is tricky. <laughs> I think that anyone who, who's done it will, will be able to understand that, um, especially somewhere like Europe where the, the buildings are older, the, um, the, the countries don't have universal ADA laws quite the way the US does. Um, but with a lot of planning, we're hoping we can still get a, a good trip like that in. Yeah, it's quite different outside the U.S., right? We're sometimes a little spoiled here, but yes. thank you so much for sharing. I'm sorry that your trip to Europe is on hold right now, but I'm sure that you guys are going to have it one day and you guys are going to have a beautiful time. Mm -hmm. um, and, it's, and it's great that, you know, to hear you have great plans and then you have really good support from your wife. You know, one of the things with, with adult patients that I think is very different from pediatrics is that whenever I talk to them, um, it's a lot of people have their life already, like you, figure out, right? You know what things work for you, what things don't work for you. And, and our job comes to be more like a, a help, you know, on the side for specific things. For example, uh, whenever a patient wants to start driving, so we send them to get a driving evaluation, to get the car adapted for their needs, or to help them with transportation or how to get to college. And you went through all of these, obviously, and I'm sure you had help. Uh, but I think the neurology clinic or the neurovascular clinic and the whole team is also, it's also helpful for those situations. Mm -hmm. And, and also, I, I try also to get the rest of the team involved in a specific area, like the social worker or the case manager, that it's going to find uh, specific things that they can, you know, that they can help our patients. So it's a different kind of care, but it's obviously an important care. Um, we have talked a bit about living with SMA, but now let's talk about considering new treatments. Kevin and Erin, as a family with a young uh, child, what led you to consider Bristi? Um, partially because we felt like we had missed out on not getting Bear into a clinical trial earlier. We became really serious about following trials. Um, Kevin always did the research into all the therapies that might be available. Yeah, and I, I had first heard about Abrizzi from another family nearby us on the island, and that's when I started to kind of explore it and look into it. Um, and after learning more about the clinical data and talking with Bear's doctor about the studies, um, we decided to pursue the treatment. And how did you start that discussion with Bear's uh, healthcare provider? Um, well, we had an appointment set up at the SMA clinic, um, and we were already looking into a RISD, so then we just brought it up to Bear's neurologist, and she thought it would be a good way to go, and it just confirmed what we were already thinking. And tell me a little bit about what helped you to make that decision to start a RISD. What information was important for you guys at that point? Um, yeah, in doing my own research and also talking more about his doctor and learning how Brizzy was designed to work, it really caught our interest and um, you know, we felt like it could be a good option for Bear. Great. And Adam, what led you to consider Brizzy? Why did you decide to start treatment? At the time I was diagnosed with SMA, there were no treatments available and even information about um, nutrition or physical therapy or other interventions was pretty limited. So we just monitor the disease for years. A few years ago, I heard that there were some treatments in the pipeline that were starting to get close. And so I went back into a neurologist for the first time in a while to, to discuss if some of those might be a, a good fit for me. Um, I have made a lot of adaptations in my life to, to make it work well for me. Um, you know, that includes modifying my house. I've got a, a 
grab bar in the shower and removed a barrier that I could get in and out. Uh, there's a ramp that's built to our house to, to get the wheelchair in and out. Um, so I'm, I'm used to making those adaptations to, to live independently. Um, so when I talk to the doctor about IVRSD, we know that SMA is a progressive disease and based on the clinical data, um, is RISD seem like a, a good option for me? Great. And what advice uh, might you give to other adults considering treatment? I think adults with SMA might feel like they have fewer options or they might not have seen a neurologist in a little while if they, they hadn't you know, uh, received a, a treatment in the past. I think because we're, we're at a time where some of those options are changing, now is a really good time to go in, see a neurologist, have that conversation. Um, you know, make sure you know what all your options are and figure out what the right one is for you. Yeah, and you mentioned something about not following with a neurologist for a while. And I think, like you said, now there are treatments, but it's always important to remember it's not only about the treatment itself, but also the whole standard of care, right? Because we have to think about lungs, we have to think about GI stuff, everything else that goes around the condition. So um, I think that's a great advice. And I'm glad you, you're back now with, with a neurologist. Ernie, Kevin, what advice might you give to other families considering a RISD? Um, I think as a parent, you really have to advocate for your child. Um, it's important to research, you know, what the right decision is for you and your family because everyone is different. Um, we know SMA is different for each patient. So really it's about, you know, looking at all the options that are out there. Right. So that's a great reminder, Kevin. You know, as a physician, I want all the patients and families I work with to understand what their choices are. So something that obviously I do after we go through the process of explaining the condition and talking about the, the possible symptoms that are gonna develop the complications, um, I talk to them about their options. And once the family decides for a specific therapy, they will uh, usually fill up a star form uh, that I think is a great, point to start the process and to have that support from the company, having that support of that person that you can connect directly to ask about the insurance process, to ask about questions that you may not get answered from, from us, from the physicians directly. Um, and I also, again, like I told Adam, I think it's very important to remember that, that the standard of care is key. Right now, we don't have a definite cure uh, all of these treatments are amazing, but but we really need to continue doing um, the treatment uh, that completes the patient, you know, like the nutritional treatment and the respiratory treatment and so on. So let's talk about what life looks like today. Erin and Kevin, what's your family's routine? Um, well, up until the start of the pandemic, um, Bear was in pre-K from 9.30 to 3.30 every day. Um, overall, he seemed to love it. He was super excited to make friends. Um, and he's eager that he's getting back to school now, the start of the school year. Um, for fun, you know, we use our pool as much as possible. Um, Bear likes going for bike rides, and we have a seat on the back of my bike for that, so it's, it's really fun. How has your routine changed since Bear started at Bristy? In our daily routine, it's just making sure that Bear gets his medication on time around the same time every day. I give him the dose of Bristy every, every morning with his first meal of the day. And at first I was just really nervous about that responsibility. I didn't want to forget, um, but that really hasn't been a problem. Everything for him is written down. Um, he has a daily schedule and it's important. So I don't forget. And I'm sure he will remind you anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so, how about you, Adam? What's your routine with a Brisbane? Being in charge of my treatment is new to me, but each morning I have my breakfast. I take the uh, Everisti out of the fridge. I draw my dose out. And I take it right after breakfast. Uh, it's just become part of my morning routine and I lock that in every morning as part of my routine. Great. And they talked earlier about improvements in motor function. Kevin and Erin, what improvements have you noticed in Bear? Yeah, Bear does physical and occupational therapy four to five times a week. Um, and they do regular tests that measure more strength in his extremities, especially his hands. He has a better grasp, more control over his fingers. One of the test measures his ability to pick up a cup. And he was very excited when he could do that one all on his own. He just picked it up and he was like, look at this. Um, so we've noticed more strength in his legs as well. One of the other measurements they do is um, looking at his ability to move his feet up and down and he's really gotten the ability to do that more. Yeah, and Bear, you know, he remembers all these details. You know, he likes making progress. You know, he's very competitive. 
you know, we know progress isn't a guarantee going forward. So, you know, we've been teaching him the idea of, you know, two steps forward and one step back. You know, even when he feels like he's not making progress, it's important to keep trying, you know, keep his confidence up and, and keep him motivated. That's good. And, and it's a good point that you make, you know, because sometimes improvements are very, very slow, but they're happening. And sometimes we, we kind of don't recognize that, you know, and those little things every day really matter uh, for, for, you know, for your son in your case or for Adam. How about you, Adam? What improvements have you noticed? My wife has noticed small improvements, which is good because she's the one who's watching me day to day. The way I describe it is I've always had some stronger days and some weaker days where I'm not feeling my, my strongest. It's not so much that I'm feeling any stronger on my stronger days, but instead that my weaker days aren't as bad as they used to be. I've been working with a physical therapist and we're working on functional motor activities, which is a, a good thing, you know, moving a, an object from one side of the table to the other or going from like a, a laying into a sitting position. And, and those are, are real practical uh, things. I, I appreciate working with my physical therapist on those as opposed to something more abstract, like just a pounds of grip strength measure where you know, even if that goes up a little bit, it, it's hard to identify exactly what that means to you uh, day to day. So I'm, I'm happy to be working with my physical therapist on these functional tests. Exactly. Because sometimes, you know, the measurements we have are not ideal because they're not looking at all the little improvements or things that are changing in your life or that have functional um, really results for you. So it's very important not only to have those evaluated by, by your therapist, but also, you know, I, I always advise my patients, write it down, uh, write anything that has happened, anything that has changed, I think is very important for us to know. And what are some of your personal priorities, Adam? I am definitely focused on my career and I wanna spend time with my wife and take advantage of the, the food and the music and the travel that we wanna to do together. Hopefully to Europe. Hopefully. Yeah. Ernie and Kevin, what are your hopes for the future? Um, as a family, I just hope that we're helping Bear feel comfortable with his condition and encouraging him to pursue the things that he loves to do. Yeah, that's great. And I understand you have become advocates in your local community. Tell us more. Why do you want to get involved? Well, for us, it feels important that we're helping other families that are like us um, and hopefully saving people from some of the mistakes that we've made. Any opportunity we have to share, we're always up for it. Um, you know, it's all for the bigger and better goal of making SMA a condition that people know about and showing people that there are options for treatment. And based on your learning as advocates, what advice or message do you have for other SMA families? I think that it's extremely important to look after your own mental health. You know, I try not to go into a dark cave. Sometimes you have to do that, but it's important to come out of that cave and move on. We tell everyone we meet that's in the same situation to get a therapist. We go to therapy as much as we can and we're very open with Bear about that. He knows where we are and what we're doing and he's welcome to join and sometimes he does. Um, and as we mentioned before, I say realize that you are the point person for your child's health and your family's life and just take that responsibility now. You don't want to waste time trying to figure that out. And lastly, um, try to go to conferences and meet or talk with other families or people that are in a similar situation that's made a huge difference for us in dealing with grief or loss and change. Um, finding people that are in the same stage as you to connect with or people that have been through this already, it gives you hope and it really makes you feel like you're not alone. And that's a big part of being able to move forward and realizing that we're all just doing the best that we can. That's, that's wonderful advice. And, and my favorite is get your therapist. I think we all need it anyway. So. And Adam, what final thoughts would you like to leave with everyone here today? Sure. So especially for the adults, if you, you haven't been to see a neurologist in a while, now's a great time to go. I, I know that I, for a long time, went you know, once a year-ish, and then for several years, I kind of stopped going altogether. But I'm really glad that I came back in and I had that conversation with my neurologist. Uh, if you haven't had that conversation recently, your options might have changed. And it's a good time to get back in there and talk about what the best options for you are. Also great advice. And Erin and Kevin, how about you? Any final thoughts you would like to share? Um, I would just say that I'm sure that every parent feels like they're coming up short. You know, it's, it's never possible to be the perfect parent. And SMA, 
you know, as a disease, you know, heightens that feeling. You always feel like you could be doing something more. Um, so it's important to be kind to yourself, you know, and give yourself a break, you know, as every parent should. Um, you can't do everything. You have to do what you can and be okay with that, you know, kind of roll with the punches and accept the failures. Yeah, we always like to try and be more open. We we tell people to make room in yourself and see what life can be for you and your family. And I think what holds us back a lot is the idea that this isn't what I pictured and this isn't what I wanted for my child. This isn't what I wanted for myself, which can be extremely difficult. But the more you're willing to try to let go of those parameters, you can realize that you do have something amazing and you can shape that into your new dream. Thank you so much, Erin. And thank you so much to each of you for sharing your experience. I know that from working with families living with SMA, hearing from other people and families with SMA can be really powerful. That's why I advise to get very close to foundations and to groups because it really it really makes a difference. And thank you so much. I really appreciate all your time. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you to Kevin, Erin, and Adam for sharing their experiences. And I hope this was very helpful for all of you. Talk to your healthcare provider to find if Ebristi is right for you. Thank you so much and have a great day.